that we lost jobs. But nonetheless, let me just give you some figures. Two developed countries, UK and France. Let me remind you that in France, since we progressively moved towards this global free trade, the economy rose by 80, 80% during the 20-year period. Fine performance. And unemployment went from 420,000 people to 5.1 million. Let me give you, if I may, Mr. Chairman, for the United Kingdom. Between 1971 and 1991, gross national product rose by 49.5%. But the number of people living in poverty has risen from 6.6 million to 13.6 million. The number of children being brought up in poverty. This is a developed country. One of the great old economies and nations. 4.1 million, 32% of children in the land officially designated as living in poverty. Now what good, Mr. Chairman, is it to have an economy that grows well, where everybody and all the economists can say how fantastic, where the politicians can say we're going to get extra growth, where businessmen can say our profits are up, if the number of people in, and the markets are almost at all-time high, Mr. Chairman, in England, number of people in poverty living from 6.6 .6 to 13.6 million and the number of children living in poverty one in three number of people being unemployed in France from 420,000 to 5.1 million now I'm not here as a bleeding heart liberal I'm a hard-headed realist and it is my view that if we try and make profits and at the same time destroy our nations no one will benefit from it, even those who make the profits. Mr. Chairman, those were the points that I wanted to... Well, you said uh, making the policy on the deck of the Titanic. I agree with you. I was just... Uh, a lot of other points with our distinguished former witness and uh, talking about how we had to reach out, we had to do this and do that from the United States level. Uh, for the developing countries out in the Pacific Rim, there's just so much the economy can stand. It sounds like almost the Vietnam policy. In other words, we've got to destroy our economy to save the free world. It's the same kind of uh, trade policy, uh, apparently, that we have. The investment is going. Uh, I don't know whether you were here, but the investment is going in the most recent issue of Business Week. 69 billion offshore. And, right. and an increase of 40% down into Mexico itself. Mr. So, Chairman, you just have to look at Felix Rotin's yes, uh, testimony. 500 billion is estimated in a few years for China. You talked about the ones in England. We also have in that displaced workers been faring 4.5 million people lost permanent jobs from 1991. 1993 in the United States. They talked about the good news, how some were re-employed, but one-fifth of the displaced workers were still looking for work. Thirteen percent had left the labor force. Further, some 47 percent of those back at full-time jobs were making less than before. And nearly a third of this group suffered pay cuts of 20 percent or more. And that's not counting those who became self-employed or the 9% of former full-timers who were working part-time. Business Week, November the 14th, with a just recent issue to the uh, effect that uh, we were really uh, going out of business. Uh, I, I, uh, let me yield to Senate action. Could I, could I just yes. comment on that point, yes, Mr. Sir. Chairman, Senator? We got the same thing going here. I mean... I, I have the great affection for England. I, I've made the comment uh, that uh, they were told about this service economy, service economy. Don't worry. That's what the Harvard up East thinkers were telling us. Uh, in fact, I, I was at Renaissance with President Clinton when Michael Porter from Harvard was there, and he was still lecturing on the comparative advantage, David Ricardo. And I just looked and said, yeah, the comparative advantage. That's why BMW is coming to South Carolina. We have never made an automobile in our history. I mean, come on. It's the wage advantage. 
$30 in Munich, $15 in Spartanburg, and yes, we make an outstanding automobile. So these up in Washington that retrain, retrain, I can train them to make automobiles. I'm making computers. I got digital down there. I've got 48 Japanese plants, Fuji. I'm in pharmaceuticals with Hoffman LaRoche. Don't tell me about I need more training. It's the people with training who are losing their jobs. They don't seem to understand, but let me hear your comment. I'm sorry. The last, the, the only comment I wanted to make was the question of inflation was brought up. The biggest single component of inflation, I think it's all about, about two-thirds, is wages. The reason why this time there's been a recovery in indices and GNP, despite the very substantial pressure, downward pressure on interest rates and uh, facilitating uh, credit to the banking system, is because salaries, earnings, have either gone down or risen very little relative to the period of the recovery. And that is the whole philosophy is we can keep inflation down by keeping wages down. And we have forgotten the purpose of the economy, which is to enrich, to create a stable society, and to include the population, the vast number of people in active life. And instead we believe that if we can reduce salaries, we can keep inflation down. That's the wrong way around. We've just forgotten what the economy is about. What its purpose is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Sir, Sir James Goldsmith, welcome to the Commerce Committee. The last time you were here, I wanted to be here, but I had an armed services meeting at the same time that was uh, also very important. I couldn't make it. Thanks for coming back again. I've listened with great interest to your opening statement. I do not know how much, uh, when you came in with the previous witness, uh, I'll ask you some of the same questions, but basically I appreciate very much the fact that you come here today. We have not always agreed, I don't know whether you remember or not, but there was a time when you were attempting to take over the Goodyear Corporation, and since Goodyear was very much very prominent in our economy on a parochial uh, matter, uh, I oppose you very much. But I've always uh, done some uh, study of you, and I've always admired uh, your freewheeling spirit with regard to... Uh, uh, getting things done, creating jobs. Let me uh, start out, if I can, with you, and I'll abbreviate the question because I asked it of the previous witness. One of the concerns that I have on this matter, and I have not made up my mind, is the part of the World Trade Organization that I am afraid gives up the sovereignty of uh, the United States of America. Uh, I would simply say that I suspect that uh, your country of Great Britain and the United States would not be in the United Nations had they not the big five having veto powers. It seemed to me like that the one man, one vote principle is being carried too far in this particular matter. Particularly, I am concerned about the fact that one man, one vote, if Bangladesh, one of the 113 nations in the United States, had a trade dispute... As I understand it, if they couldn't reconcile this through the usual procedures, it goes to a three-member commission appointed by the uh, 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 GATT called the World Trade Organization who meet in secret and take testimony in secret and make their decision. And if the decision would be against the United States of America in this instance, uh, the only way that the United States of America could overturn that would be to go to the 113 nation total agreement and get unanimous uh, support to override whatever the decision was made by that three-member panel, including Bangladesh, who uh, brought the uh, action. Uh, it, 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 is that a fair interpretation of of, uh, uh, of a concern that I state? Do you see it that way? Senator, there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the World Trade Organization is a major diminution of sovereignty. Now, the exact mechanisms, I believe, in fact, the Director General can try and settle the problem beforehand. For the same reasons as Felix Roten would not wish to get into the exact mechanisms, I will not either. I've also read a lot about it. I'm on the uh, Foreign Relations Committee in the European Parliament, and I've tried to study the issues. But the one thing which is certain is bottom line. This is giving up 
national sovereignty. It can't be otherwise. Otherwise, why would it exist? What is its purpose?